We got this new book called Regeneration Through Violence, The Mythology of the American Frontier, 1600 to 1860, by Richard Slotkin. It's published in 1973, so 40 years ago this was published. And it'll give some insight into Daniel Boone in Kentucky. Um, and I want to read a, a couple uh, of the first pages. So you have two quotes here, right before chapter one. There was, thank God, a great voluptuary born to the American settlements against the niggardliness of the damning purit puritanical tradition. One who, by the single logic of his passion, which he rested on the savage life, about him destroyed at its spring that spiritually withering plague. For this he has remained since buried in the miscolored legend and left for rotten. Far from dead, however, but full of a rich regenerative violence, he remains when his history will be carefully reported for us who have come after to call upon him. William Carlos Williams in the American Grain. But you have there the myth of the essential white America, all the other stuff, the love, the democracy, the floundering into lust, is a sort of byplay. The essential American soul is hard, isolate, stoic, and a killer. It is never yet melted. D.H. Lawrence, Studies in Classical American Literature. Chapter 1, Myth and Literature in the New World. The mythology of a nation is the intelligible mask of that enigma called the national character. Through myths, the psychology and worldview of our culture ancestors are transmitted to modern descendants in such a way and with such power that our perception of contemporary reality and our ability to function in the world are directly, often tragically, affected. American attitudes towards the idea of a national mythology have been peculiarly ambivalent. There is a strong anti-mythological stream in our culture deriving from the utopian ideals of certain of the original colonists and of the revolutionary generation, which asserts that this new world is to be liberated from the dead hand of the past and become the scene of a new departure in human affairs. Nonetheless, we have continually felt the need for the sense of coherence and direction in history that myths give to us to give to those who believe in them. The poets of the early years of the Republic taught as part of their classical education that national mythologies are embodied in literature and begin with national epics in the manner of Homer, attempted to fabricate an American epic that would mark the beginning of a national mythology, providing a context for all works to come after. Their concept of myth was essentially artificial and typically American. They believed, in effect, that a mythology could be put together on the ground, like the governments of frontier communities or the national constitution either by specialist or by the spontaneous awakening of the popular genius. Like the Constitution, such myth epics would reflect the most progressive ideas of American man, emphasizing the rule of reason in nature and in human affairs, casting aside all inherited traditions, superstitions, and spurious values of the past. The freedom and power of man were to be asserted against the ideas of necessity, of historical determinant, determinism, of the inheritance of guilt and original sin. From Barlow's Columbiad and Dwight's Greenfield Hill in the late 18th century, through Walt Whitman's Song of Myself and Herman Melville's Moby Dick in the 19th century, to Hart Crane's The Bridge and Williams Patterson, or the great American novel in the 20th century, American writers have attempted the Homeric task of providing through epic poetry or epic fiction, a starting point for a new, uniquely American mythology. Even scholarly critics who address themselves to the problem of the myth of America have a marked tendency to engage in the manufacture of the myth they pretend to analyze in an attempt to reshape the character of their people or to justify some preconceived or inherited notion of American uniqueness. Such critics are themselves a part of this national phenomenon of myth consciousness, this continual preoccupation with the necessity of defining or creating a national identity, a character for us to live in the world. Works like The Columbiad and The Bridge, whatever their artistic merit, failed, at least in their author's lifetimes. To achieve that quasi-religious power throughout the whole of a culture that is characteristic 
attribute of true myth. The premises of such works do not take into account the facts that myth-making is a primary attribute of the human mind and that the process of mythogenesis in a culture is one of continuous activity rather than dramatic stops and starts. True myths are generated on a subliterary level by the historical experience of a people and thus constitute part of that inner reality which the work of the artist draws on, illuminates, and explains. In American mythogenesis, the founding fathers were not those 18th century gentlemen who composed a nation at Philadelphia. Rather, they were those, to paraphrase Faulkner's Absalom, Absalom tore violently a nation from the implacable and opulent wilderness, the rogues, adventurers, and land boomers, the Indian fighters, traders, missionaries, explorers, and hunters who killed and were killed until they had mastered the wilderness. The settlers who came after, suffering hardship in Indian warfare for the sake of a sacred mission or a simple desire for land, and the Indians themselves, both, both as they were and as they appeared to the settlers, for whom they were the special demonic personification of the American wilderness. Their concerns, their hopes, their terrors, their violence, and their justifications of themselves as expressed in literature are the foundation stones of the mythology that informs our history. The failure of writers and critics to recognize and deal with the real mythological heritage of their time and people has consequences that go beyond the success or failure of their literary works. A people unaware of its myths is likely to continue living by them, though the world around that people may change and demand changes in their psychology their worldview, their ethics, and their institutions. The anti-mythologists of the American Age of Reason believed in the imminence of a rational republic of yeomen farmers and enlightened leaders living amicably in the light of natural law and the Constitution. They were thereby left unprepared when the Jeffersonian Republic was overcome by the Jacksonian democracy of the Western man on the make, the speculator, and the wildcat banker, when racist irrationalism in a falsely conceived economics prolonged and intensified slavery in the teeth of American democratic idealism. And when men like Davy Crockett became national heroes by defining national aspiration in terms of so many bears destroyed, so much land preempted, so many trees hacked down, so many Indians and Mexicans dead in the dust. The voluminous reports of presidential commissions on violence, racism, and civil disorder have recently begun to say to us what artists like Melville and Faulkner had earlier prophesied, that myths reach out of the past to cripple, incapacitate, or strike down the living. It is by now commonplace that our adherence to the myth of the frontier, the conception of America as a wide open land of unlimited opportunity for the strong, ambitious, self-reliant individual to thrust his way to the top, has blinded us to the consequences of the industrial and urban revolutions and to the need for social reform and a new concept of individual and communal warfare, welfare. Nor is it by a far-fetched association that the murderous violence that has characterized recent political life has been linked by poets and news commentators alike to the frontier psychology of our recent past and our long heritage. The first colonists saw in America an opportunity to regenerate their fortunes, their spirits, and the power of their church and nation. But the means to that regeneration ultimately became the means of violence. And the myth of regeneration through violence became the structuring metaphor of the American experience. How that myth evolved and gained credence and power is the subject of this study. Three critical problems lie in the path of any study of the so-called myth of America. The first is the question of the Americanness of its origin. Myths are human creations, and the people who composed the vast majority of the American population before 1800 were European by ancestry, by language, and by religious and literary heritage. The only non-European native cultures were those of the Indians. Like the colonists, the Indians had mythologies based on their experience in the world, in the Indians' case, the American wilderness. Did those same conditions operating on European immigrants impose on or induce in the colonial mind a similarly American mythology? We know that the colonists adapted their ways of living, farming, hunting, and fighting in order to survive in the Indian's world. Did they also, to some degree, acquire an Indian-like vision of the New World? 
in Indian American mythology, since the Indian is, from our point of view, the only one who can claim to be indigenously American. It seems important to question whether our national experience has Americanized or Indianized us, or whether we are simply an idiosyncratic offshoot of English civilization. The second critical problem arises from the fact that this artificially created American nation, the self-baptized American people, first saw light in the age of the printing press. Mythologies arise spontaneously in the pre-literary epics of a people's history and consequently are artless in their portrayal of the world and the gods, appealing to the emotions rather than the intelligence. American myths, tales of heroes in particular, frequently turn out to be the work of literary hacks or of promoters seeking to sell American real estate by mythologists mythologizing mythologizing the land the landscape so to make the landscape into a myth sort of like in Kentucky uh, in our horse industry the myth is the antebellum plantation era uh, which is why the Kentucky Derby gives me the creeps it, it looks like the antebellum plantation and in order to have that that myth in your mind, for that to exist, you, you cannot forget what uh, how the plantations were allowed to be in existence through slavery. So, uh, one of the problems with which this study has to deal is the question of the relationship between myth and literature. Is the dominance of printed literature inconsistent with the initiation and development of myth? And is the post-Gutenberg period also necessarily post-mythological? The third problem is that which lies at the source of every study of myth in history and literature, the problem of defining myth and of distinguishing between archety archetypal myth, folk legends, and artistic mythopio <laughs> mythopiosis. Mythopio mythopiosis. Such a definition must be made before we can understand what has been involved in the process of myth-making in America, what the stages of that process has been, and how our mythology acquires and exercises its power in human thoughts and affairs. I get 15 minutes, so I'm just going to keep on going. So mythogenesis. Uh, mythology is a complex of narratives that dramatizes a world vision and historical sense of a people or culture, reducing centuries of experience into a constellation of compelling metaphors. The narrative action of the myth tale recapitulates that people's experience in their land, rehearses their visions of that experience in its relation to their gods and the cosmos, and reduces both experience and vision to a paradigm. Reference to that myth or to things associated with it, as in religious ritual, evokes in the people the sense of life inherent in the myth and all but compels belief in the vision of reality and divinity implicit in it. The believer's response to this myth is essentially non-rational and religious. He recognizes in the myth his own features and experience, the life and appearance of his ancestors, and the faces of the gods who rule his universe. And he feels that the myth has put him in an intimate contact with the ultimate powers which shapes all life. Thus, myth can be seen as an intellectual or artistic construct that bridges the gap between the world of the mind and the world of affairs, between dream and in reality, between impulse or desire and action. It draws on the content of the individual and collective memory, structures it, and develops from it imperatives for belief and action. The ultimate source of myth is the human mind itself. For man is a myth-making animal. He naturally seeks to understand his world in order to control it. And his first act in encompassing this end is an act of the mind or imagination. On the basis of limited, finite experience, he creates a hypothetical vision of a universal, infinite order and imposes that, hypothetic, his, that hypothesis on his perception of the phenomena of nature and his own behavior. He tests his vision by acting in accordance with the principles of behavior that seem to be demanded by reality as he envisions it. Insofar that behavior is consistent with the universal order, it will seem to prosper him and acquire the name of virtue. So, check it out. Regeneration Through Violence, Richard Slotkin.